In any life, we have highs and lows, light and dark, wins and losses. What happens when we encounter that moment in time when what happens next could change everything? Join us as we step into another person's inspirational moment and see how we can connect their experience to ours. This is Greg Stevens, and you're listening to A Shot of Inspiration. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of A Shot of Inspiration. We have a truly inspirational guest today. He's the author of two books. The first he co-authored with Todd Sivan. It's called Pulling Each Other Along. And a second one is a children's book called A Pound of Kindness. He works closely with Dave Clark and Dave Stevens, both former professional athletes that broke barriers in professional sports as they had severe disabilities when they played. He also has his own podcast called Pulling Each Other Along, which he graciously honored me by asking me to be a guest. And it was actually my first appearance on someone else's podcast. So thank you for that experience. Friends and family, this is Doug Cordefield. And Doug, thank you for being on the show today. Hey, Greg, it's a privilege. It's been a privilege to get to know you. It's kind of exciting to know that I was your first, you were the guest of our show, and that was the first one you ever did. So you did great. You obviously are natural. So, and I think you're still number one on my downloads. I love to hear that for sure. On the, on the thing, each other long well, podcast. You have so many great inspirational stories to tell, so I really want to jump in, and I want you to share with our listeners a little about your organization and what really led you into this inspirational life. I think you're one of the most inspirational people I've met because of what you're doing in the world. So let's talk about what you're doing and what led you to that. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a longer story. I'll try to give the summary because, you know, we try to give the summary of these things. People can find out more by getting our book in the first chapter, all those kind of things. But my son, I have a son who's now 24 years old. He was born with neither arm developed. And so when all of a sudden you're birthed into the world, he was my fifth child and his name's Gideon. So he was born. We didn't even know because we are actually doing home births. So we didn't even know when we had this emergency birth uh, of Gideon now 24, almost going on 25 years ago that when we were at the hospital and all of a sudden you could see that he was, he had these limitations he was two pounds, but at first you're just wondering if he's going to live, you know, all those kind of things. And they swept him away from us. So it's, it's a pretty whirlwind type of time that you have those memories that don't ever leave you. Flash forward about a year and a half later, I was moving my family from the Atlanta area to Corning, New York. This is where my wife and I met. And during that transition, I was working with my brothers, partnering at a major financial firm, Merrill Lynch. And during that time, I was studying for my Series 7, Series 66. I was doing a lot of coffee shop studying because I'm not a quiet library kind of guy. And in t taking some breaks, the newspapers were still available back then. And I was reading like the Atlanta Journal or Constitution and reading this article about this man named Dave Clark who had played professional baseball on crutches. And I'm like, who is this guy? Why don't I know him? How did he play professional baseball on crutches? All these things are flying through my brain. But the weirdest thing about reading that article is it said he was from Corning. And I'd never heard of him. And when I was a scholarship athlete myself, we played every sport growing up. My dad was in the sporting goods industry. So I grew up meeting celebrities in the sports world as a kid, like Jesse Owens as a kid, those kind of things. And so I'm sitting here going, what in the world? Who is this? And if people know Corning, yes, it's a big Fortune 500 company town but it's only about 10,000 people. I mean, the idea of a traffic jam for us is waiting at the stop sign. Anyway, so as it would go, Dave had just finished his career of coaching in the Swedish major leagues. Dave had played this 10-year career of playing minor league baseball on his crutches, which is really the most incredible sports story most people have never heard until this very second for some people. And he's only five foot two polio survivor. And so I'm sitting here wanting to meet this man. And Dave had finished his career coaching in the Swedish major leagues after three championship coaching seasons in a row. And he was scouting, I think for the San Diego Padres when I first met him. And he was working at a local professional team as a part-time pitching coach, just kind of half retired in the baseball world. And he moved back to Corning. And so here I've got this one and a half year old that wasn't even walking yet and I'm asking my brother, who in the heck is this Dave Clark guy? And my older brother goes, well, I know Dave. And I'm like, how comes I don't know this Dave Clark? And so as it would be, we met at a baseball field. 
in Elmira, New York, where Dave was a pitching coach. I go to him after the game, getting a dugout. I have Gideon in my arms. And as he remembers, we kind of piece this deal together because it's now going on 20, 23, 24 years ago. I basically asked him if we could meet. And he said yes. And I think he had a little media time that he had to do after the game with local press. And so after that, we met, we talked. And we had breakfast a few weeks later. He got his cell phone. We had breakfast. I'm sitting here thinking, I got questions for this guy. And the only thing I can truly remember about our breakfast meeting, this is what I tell people when I bring up this story, is we had breakfast in the little beautiful town of Corny, New York. And I remember after the breakfast, Dave said to me, nobody has ever asked me questions like that. And it's because I was peppered with questions. What did your parents do? How did they get you in school? All these little questions that would have come in my mind at that time, because I was coming from being a father of a child with limitations. And here's this unbelievably successful man that I can't even grasp the success that he's had. He was in a scooter at the time. He's five foot two. He's barely walking. And I'm thinking, how in the world did you do all this stuff? What did your parents do to make that happen? And so that's how our relationship started. And then I'm over dinner. I pushed him. He became a client of mine. So I got more time with him. We spent more time talking about baseball and other things than we did about finances. We became friends. And 10 years later, I guess, if I want to keep rambling here to wrap up this story, Greg, 10 years later, I finally got him to, or eight years later, let's say, I finally got him to write a book. He had made several other attempts, but this one stuck. And I said, Dave, just write this book. We'll figure it out later. Of course, in my mind, literally back then, I'm thinking movie deal. I'm thinking something's got to be done with this story. <laughs> right. And so anyway, he did this book and I was rereading the book in my office when I was helping him organize book signings. And I was into chapter two. Chapter two is an amazing chapter because what Dave does in that chapter is he thanks the people that helped him. It's actually titled My Saviors, like a small S kind of savior. His dad, his gym teacher. But the story that I'll tell right here will lead us into my two books that I've written. And so here I'm reading the story. Dave has got all sorts of anxiety built up because of a field trip that he's taking to the fire hall. His teacher announces a trip to the fire hall. It's five blocks away. He's got braces that are very heavy, like the Forrest Gump style braces. He's got crutches and he doesn't want to go to school. He's got two weeks to dread this event coming. And his teacher had announced it. She talks about it. It gets ner more nervous, more anxious as the day comes through. So much so the day of the event, he tries to fake his mother out and act sick, which most of us have tried that at least once. So he's doing the I'm sick thing. He's a terrible actor even to this day. <laughs> his mom knows better. And he says she was old school. So it's like, no, Dave, get ready. Get ready right now. You're not going to be late. So gets to school, gets to the back of the line thinking this is going to be the absolute worst day of his life. And unknown to him, a classmate of his when he gets in line had brought his radio flyer wagon to school to pull him that day. Dave never forgot it. Wow. No. He thanked this man named Ernie Pound in his book. And of course, I'm a father with a special needs. Every time I read that chapter, and this wasn't the first time I was reading it, I'd get the goosebumps. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I got to find this guy. And I did. He was living about 45 minutes away from Corning. Found out that Dave and he had not even seen each other since first grade. The family had left the area. But he remembered the wagon. Didn't know Dave went on to play professional baseball, coach in the Olympics, coach for the Atlanta Braves, international coach, owned a baseball team, all those things. He had no idea. So he comes to that book signing. When he walked through the door, I immediately said, that has to be him. I could just tell. I could just tell. And I was right. I took him a book. I said, Dave's going to want you to have one of these. And he gets in line. There was a big line that day at this coffee shop. Gets to Dave. And when Dave says, who should I sign this to? He just simply says, sign this one to Ernie Pound. Oh, and of course, crazy. if you can, if you can sense the oh, emotions that got. I'm, right now I'm sitting here just like, wow, that's just yeah. amazing. And anyway, so we captured that on video. People can go to a pound of kindness. I know it's on the front page of that video and that connection. It's only like okay. a one minute video. So it's well worth your time. Dave and I, when I finally left Merrill Lynch, I told him I wanted to do something with his story. And when we put together business plans and all those kind of things, Dave had me fly down to Florida 
And basically, I went to one of his sports camps. Now, Dave had been doing this for years. But this was a sports camp he was doing for children with special needs. And it was with professional team. It was with the Minnesota Twins minor league team at the spring training facility of the pros, of the majors. Beautiful stadium. The kids are right out on the field. Beautiful sunny day. And he sets up drills for all these kids to do with these minor league pro players doing the drills with these kids and young adults. And I'm like, this is great. And so when Dave and I met again for a business meeting, I have all these plans, doing documentaries, doing movies, speaking events, books, all this stuff you put in a business plan. And Dave goes, well, I want to do more sports camps for kids with disabilities. That's where I want to leave my legacy. And I said, okay, let's figure it out. And somehow, some way, 12 years later, we're still doing sports camps for kids with disabilities with major roadblocks like COVID and other things. But that's really the heart of Dave Clark. And, and so when you say, how did this happen? Two people collided, two souls collided, whatever you want to say yeah. to make this happen. And uh, we don't get paid a lot for it. Not that we're against getting paid a lot for it because <laughs> we need money to make this stuff happen. Right. But uh, that's what we do. And we inspire a lot of people. We pulled in Dave Stevens, as you had mentioned earlier, about six years ago, another, we could have, I'm hoping you have both of these guys on your podcast soon, and then you can get the story straight from them. I want them on for sure. And Dave Clark, I was watching one of the videos on one of the sites. I love what he said. It's not about sports. It's about the exploration of potential. And I love that because most people, when they see someone with a disability, they don't think of that. And love that you're doing that. So folks, if you feel led, I really encourage you. Doug's going to have some information where you can find him, help support some of the things he's up to, because I believe what he's doing out there in the world is going to be touching millions. And you want to be a part of that for sure. Um, Thanks, Greg. And yeah, we need the partners. We need people to come in with us, especially after this COVID thing. It's like the train got knocked over. We were running down the tracks, things were starting to hum, speaking events were happening, movie deals were being signed, all those kind of things. And then this thing, COVID happened and you're like, oh my gosh, I got to start over again. That's what it feels like. You even said, Dave Clark, you were going to have another sporting event in Fort Myers and the hurricane just went through. So you've got all kinds of barriers there as well. Yeah, that one. We talk about this with the folks at our camps. One of the models, uh, whatever motive type or sayings that we use, I guess is the right way to say it, is there's no problems, just solutions. And I don't think I could be doing what I was doing if somebody would not have given me that phrase many, many years ago. (laughs) And it was just a friend of mine. He was a contractor working on our house. I was helping him. He was really doing it pro bono for me. I was paying for materials and he was helping me. I was trying to throw my hammer at a nail with the limited skills that I had. And one of the things that released me so much is here, he's the expert. And I don't want to mess things up because I'm a novice skilled at working construction in my own basement. And he says, you know what? There's no problems. There's just solutions. And when he said that to me, it was like, it freed me up to make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. It and that freedom of this thing, I don't really know what I'm doing. He just said, if you make a mistake, I'll fix it. Yeah. So I just did the best that I could. And if I made a mistake, guess what? He fixed it. He had a solution for it. And so I took that saying from him into the sports camps because we have these kids with so many different situations. And I often say, families, there's no problems. There's just solutions. If your kids don't have hands, if they have intellectual challenges, if whatever the situation is, if they're blind, we want to come up with a solution so that they can solve the problem of hitting that ball or throwing that ball or whatever that is. And oftentimes, one of the things that we get and we hear at our events, our disability dream and do sports camps is the parents will say, I didn't know my child could do that. We hear that so many times. And unfortunately it's because they were never given a chance. And so that's what we do. We give them a chance. I think we talked about that a little on the podcast that I was on with you. We were talking about many times we don't allow the kids, no matter if they have disabilities or not to fail, to make mistakes, to push through some of that. And when we stop that, we stop any growth. Right. And tell us a story about your son when you were talking about him buckling up. It just tore me apart. 
Yeah, I think the first time I ever shared that was at the World Congress on Disabilities in Atlantic City, and Gideon was in the audience. And actually, it was a pulling each other along presentation. There's a time to pull. I don't know if you remember the song Birds, where for every season, turn, turn, turn. That's just taken out of Ecclesiastes is really what's taken out of. There's a time for this, time for that, time not to do this, time for that. So I took that because Dave couldn't make it. He was supposed to be the keynote but he had dislocated his elbow and he couldn't get on the plane because he couldn't do his crutches. So here I'm driving. My wife is driving me with Gideon down to Atlantic City. It's about a five or six hour drive. And I'm sitting on my computer putting my keynote together that I'm giving that day or next day. I can't remember. And so I came up with this thought. There's a time to pull and then there's a time not to be pulled. And there's a time to be pulled and then there's a time not to be pulled. So I took those four points and I put it into a keynote and Gideon was one of my examples. There was a time for us to not pull him. And the situation is he's getting in the car, he's getting older. He's got two younger brothers now that there's a big gap. So they're just little guys. And they started, as soon as Gideon went to get in, he would just sit down and buckle himself. And they, and the kid, the, my, his little brothers would buckle him. So he wouldn't do anything. And finally, you know, my wife and I, we'd see this over and over and over again. And we're like, all right, Gideon. We're not letting, we're not letting your little brothers buckle you in anymore. You are going to have to figure this out when he's got a little left hand that has three fingers, two function, but it's very short. His right arm is virtually nothing. Yeah. And so we saw this little boy. I can't even remember how old he was. Let's just say nine, 10. It doesn't really matter at yeah. this point. I'd have to go back and figure it out. And he sat there in the car for probably a couple of hours sitting there trying to figure out how to buckle himself in and you check on him you keep checking on him as a parent and it's pretty difficult but we did get to that point where you know what Gideon we're not helping you if we keep helping you right, right. and he's pretty independent to this day there's obviously times when it's just quicker to get a, a cup that's way up high or something for him although he'll yeah. figure it out if he needs to but He's very independent. He does his own computer stuff. He's an excellent speaker for people that want to have speaking. He's not really pursuing that right now. He's pursuing his own career. Uh, he's been a great salesman. He has sold so many products for our organization to get these kids to do sports camps for kids with disabilities. And he's just figured out where he fits in best. And I, I hope he continues to do that. And I know he will because he's got a mindset for that. That's great. That's great. I want to shift just a tad. I want to find out because I never really heard, I don't think, how you met Dave Stevens. And because I heard about Dave Clark. How about Dave Stevens? What happened there, Doug? Email or text came my way from a gentleman that said, hey, you need to meet this guy. I didn't know. David just left ESPN. ESPN did some cleansing. And so he got cleansed, so to speak, after 20 years and seven Emmys. And so here, all of a sudden, I didn't know anything about Dave, but people, because of what I do, when there's with Nick Wojcik or whatever, they're always saying, oh, do you know this? This is a great story. And they'll send them to me, and, which is great because if I don't know it, it's wonderful. So Dave was one of those. Mm -hmm. I get this email and I'm like, oh crap, he's playing professional baseball and he has no legs. And uh, I probably should reach out to this guy. And sometimes <laughs> you do, and you can't get a hold of him. Like Jim Abbott, I've never been able to get a hold of Jim Abbott. So Jim, if you're listening today, reach out to us, d3day.com. Anyway. So Dave Stevens, there was a phone number on a website or a link. And so I call it. He answers. He's in his car driving. I tell him what we do. I don't think he even knows about Dave Clark. So here's a guy that played professional baseball with no legs, ESPN for 20 years, doesn't know about Dave Clark, the only professional baseball player that ever played on crutches. And he answered the phone. We have a conversation. The quick story is he had a speaking event coming up in Connecticut. And I said, well, can I come? And so I flew there. I flew into Connecticut to spend a day in Connecticut, just hanging out with him, met a couple of his actually old ESPN buddies during that time. And then I invited him to one of my camps. But actually something miraculous happened even that week where you kind of know, okay, this has to be meant to be. But I don't know if you want to go into those kind of stories. We were talking about one earlier today okay. uh, before we recorded. I, and I don't want to tell that story, but just say it was miraculous. You're like, what and what? So Dave wound up coming to one of our camps now about six years ago. Down, I flew him down to Fort Myers. Um, obviously, he's doing batting practice with the pro players. He's putting the tee up for the kids. He's instructing them. He's out there running around on his hands and feet with the camp. What an inspiration. So all of a sudden, I'm in the pro locker room of the Minnesota Twins Spring Trainings Facility. I'm introducing usually just Dave Clark to speak to the young players. 
But now I got Dave on one side and I got this other Dave on another side. So I got my two Daves, which someday will probably be a chapter of my book, if not the title of the book, My Two Daves. That's great. The three Ds, though. I love that. <laughs> when we had D3 Day before it was Dave, Doug, and Dave. <laughs> That's great. That's amazing. It really yeah. is. Tell them what the three Ds stand for. So originally, it actually... Uh, I had a guy help me uh, with my business planning, mapping it all out. And he came up with Disability Dream Day. Mm -hmm. And that's when we were trying to put everything into one day. This mm -hmm. camp, kids getting tickets to a game later that night for these pro players. Well, Disability Dream Day for me became pretty exhausting, especially places like down in Florida, 95 degree heat in the morning. And then I'm taking a break and then I'm greeting these people that are coming back for the game that night. And I'm trying to do promotions. I'm trying to raise money. I was wiped out in that day and my son who's now a senior in high school i get my kids involved in the fundraising with what we do and he was handing out flyers my two little sons were handing out flyers they're two little boys are a year and a half apart of course everything's a competition they think they're selling the flyers when they give it away because they're that young and they're like well i sold 15 flyers well i sold 20 flyers so they're going this back and forth and before you know it they're like little salespeople for me that's great. Good as you could be. People would be coming up and they'd go, I don't care what you're selling. We're buying something because of my little boys. Right. Just being able to communicate and have that kind of spirit and attitude and excitement for what they were doing at the time. And my son, Gabriel, started calling it Disability Dream and Do. It was just the, oh, the Disability Dream and Do camps. This was, and it's because of a quote of Dave Clark's where Dave is, has one of his main quotes. He says, there's two types of dreamers. There's dreamers that dream and there's dreamers that dream and do. He had heard me share that quote probably quite often. And so in, instead of calling it disability dream day to these people, he kept calling it disability dream and do. And we were so young at that time in the organization. It's like, hey, that's still three Ds. Let's call it disability dream and do. And I like it so much more because now we have disability dream and do baseball, disability dream and do hockey, disability dream and do football, disability dream and do art, disability dream and do music. It doesn't really disability dream and do business because I'm actually discussing lightly with somebody to do a disability dream and do business class. And we really want to just give opportunities as the funding starts coming back in, allowing folks with limitations to, and we have so many stories now and there's so many connections of people to connect them with that you can dream about something big and you can do it. All right. But you got to take the steps to get there. Yeah. You got to step out there and talk about taking steps because these things don't fund themselves. And you're looking mm. at creating a mastermind for some of the work you do. Let's talk about what you want to do with the mastermind and what the not just what's going to happen there, but also the purpose in, in funding what some of the other things you're looking to do. Yeah. So obviously we're looking to the mastermind to help fund and support the sports camps that we run. So because of some of our unique connections, and I do have some pretty big names of people that are willing to participate with this, like Rocky Blyer, if you don't know the Rocky Blyer story, Rocky's a friend of mine. He's in our book, Pulling Each Other Along. He got me to write, he got Terry Bradshaw to agree to write the forward for us on this new book. And so R Rocky, he's like, yeah, if it's helping these camps and kids with disabilities, I'm in. John Konkak has also agreed to be a part of our event, at least our in-person event. And so what we're looking to bring is really high, I don't want to say high, just people that made it to the professional ranks in sports with people that have been very successful in business. And we want to bring those two mindsets together. Oftentimes, they're going to have similar difficulties. All of a sudden, you can be 35 years old, 40 years old, and you have to make a complete pivot. You were training for something your whole life. You sold a business when you're 35. Now what's next? Everybody wants a piece of you. So we're trying to bring those two mindsets together at a fairly high ticket yearly event of high networking, uh, having some fun, of course, uh, quarterly or monthly meetings, and then the networking ongoing, but introducing these men to each other so they can basically pull each other along and help with their legacies. Yeah. yeah. And, and I love that because it's something of value. It's something of meaning. It's not something that's just going to go by the wayside with what you're doing. It really does make a difference. Just like the person pulling a Dave along, not knowing that day that what it would do for his life. Right, because right. One instance can actually change a complete direction. I remember I had a coach like that 
early on. I didn't really have anyone around and he took me under his wing and it was hard on me, but taught me so much and really pushed me to all the things I do in the world today. Just some of those one moment pieces in life that help us. And we don't want to miss those. So folks, if you can look up Doug's information and we'll post it and you're interested in the mastermind or being a part of that, uh, or even just helping out volunteer work, anything like that, or can making connections. I'm sure Doug right. would love that. So Doug, yeah. as we close, what I would like to ask you one last question is, this is about inspiration. Everything you've told me has been inspirational to me. What is one final inspirational moment that you would like to share with the group just to as leave them with for the day? What would that be? Would it be something around your son or someone you've met? What would that one inspirational piece be? I'm pausing because I want to do this well. Yeah. There's a lot of different directions that I could go. Let me share the story I shared with you pre, pre-recording. Yeah. I think we have to be ready for those moments when something doesn't go quite right. We talked about no problems, just solutions. Just this past week, I went to a conference. It was a little bit of a risk for me financially right now, but I'm looking to get out there and connect with people, look for partners, which I think was successful. I met some folks. It was a a mastermind group that was putting this on. And so I got to connect with some people that potentially could really help us in the near future. But one of those unexpected things, I was trying to get home for a cross-country meet. My two boys are running cross country. They're number one in the state right now in New York, their team. Scholarships and and colleges are on the line for both of them in the near future. And so I don't want to miss meets. I got seven kids. We never mentioned that. These are my two youngest. I'm just down to the last. And so I don't want to miss this meet. But I was at this conference. So I pulled out after lunch. There was still another segment. I didn't really want to miss the segment, but I wanted to get home. I fly standby, which basically means I have to find a seat. So I'm like a leaf in the wind when I go to the airport. I'm like, okay, I can get here. I can get there and go there. There was three flights to Atlanta that would get me to Detroit that would get me home. One of the Atlanta flights got delayed because of a malfunction. So all the other Atlanta flights got booked up. I'm out. So first flight, can't get on it. Second flight, can't get on it. And all of a sudden, four hours later, I'm still in the airport trying to think, oh, can I get to Syracuse? Can I get to Rochester? Can I get to New York City and drive home? What are all these things going through my brain? And one of the women that I met, Carmen, she actually texted me, did you get out? This is somebody from the conference. Her and her husband are down in Middletown. So she's somebody I want to stay connected with. She's not very far. And we do a sports camp down in Middletown area. I'm down there quite a bit. And she texted me and she says, I'm coming to the airport. So I met her at the food court area. We're talking just a little bit. I look up the way and there is Chris Nickick. And if you don't know Chris's story, it's in our book, Pulling Each Other Along. Amazing, amazing young man of Down syndrome that has recently actually finished his second Ironman, full Ironman in the time limits it needs to be, which is just the marathons run, 100 and whatever miles on the bike, two and a half miles swim. And he went from couch potato to doing this on a program that his father, Nick, had set up for him. Amazing, amazing story. So all of a sudden, this young man in my book is standing in the middle of the airport. I'd never met him physically. I'd only talked to his father and we wrote the chapter. And I didn't even have a book with me because I'd given them out or they were on the plane heading back home. And Carmen, she actually had gotten one of my books. So she had one. I said, hey, Carmen, can I get a book so I can get a picture? And so I take a picture with Chris. And then I had a great conversation with Nick. And I say all that because these turns and the winds that blow and Dave Clark dealing with a hurricane right now and his house being destroyed and he's got a lot of dealing with the insurance and adjusters and all the stuff that you have to deal with these storms happen and you cannot avoid them you have children that sometimes are not born perfect with intellectual challenges with limitations sometimes your children get things like polio of course that hasn't happened in a long time but that happened to dave clark when he was 10 months old sometimes you're born with no legs like dave stevens but When these storms happen, if you can just calm yourself down for a minute, look to see what might happen because of the storm or because of the delay and not getting on a plane and all of the things that can happen. It's amazing to see if you just stay calm and uh, believe it or not, I got home that night and I was able to see the kids in their race, which they won. And 
Uh, they're getting ready for their state qualifier and state meet and hoping to make nationals. So, so with all of that, things can work out. You have to take a step back. You have to look at where you are. And when things don't quite work out the way you hoped, they still can work out. Yeah. 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 And like I think you said earlier, there are no problems. There are only solutions. Right. And I think that's a great way to end the day. So Doug, thank you so much for being on. I'd love to have you again. I want to keep stay in touch. And folks, thank you for being a part of this. I know you really enjoyed it. And I will see you next time on A Shot of Inspiration. So thanks so much for joining. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of A Shot of Inspiration. If you like this or any of our other episodes, make sure you rate it and share it with a friend. This is Greg Stevens, and we look forward to being with you next time. Until then, be bold, be courageous, and respectfully speak your truth.